This is The Listening Tube. Hello, and welcome to this edition of The Listening Tube. I'm your host, Bob Woodley. This time, we'll talk about some social media memes that are out to get you. We'll also examine news media, social media, and propaganda. I'm sorry, was I just being redundant? I'll try to shed some light on media bias, and we'll even take a look at my own. But first, not the headlines. There's a new trend when it comes to saying, I do, or I will, depending on how the question is asked. Oddly enough, the new trend only seems to be catching on with women. Turns out, something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue doesn't fulfill the requirements anymore. She also needs not you. Women are marrying themselves. Not just the marriage, but the engagement is also a big deal, as women declare a commitment to themselves. Insider reports that sologamy, or marrying oneself, is on the rise. The story quotes a psychologist as saying that with increased time spent at home alone, individuals have opted for new methods to appreciate themselves and enhance self-compassion. Here's what I want to know. What happens the first time you cheat on yourself? Which one of you has to sleep on the couch? And if you get divorced, who gets the kayak? This new type of self-indulgence is just another way to get attention that will ultimately lead to heartbreak and disappointment. You know you're not good enough for yourself. Who are you kidding? On the other hand, you can do better. You know you're not going to be happy with somebody who eats peanut butter right out of a jar. Fine, go ahead. Marry yourself. Just don't come running to me when you find your clothes out in the front yard and your PlayStation smashed to pieces in the driveway. Some say that marrying yourself is a sign of independence, and that's a good thing. But... I don't think that's it at all. What it is, is a sign that you've given up on yourself. Being single is one thing. You can be independent and confident in yourself, but not make what mimics a legal barrier to your love and affection. You've disallowed yourself to be in a relationship with another person by marrying yourself. Instead of building a life... You built a wall, a wall that will eventually fall, and then you'll realize what a flimsy wall it was to begin with. And here's some unfinished business. China edition. This week, the Justice Department charged five men acting on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party to stalk and harass Chinese dissidents in the United States. See, one of the things that makes America great, our freedom, is being used against us by governments that don't allow the same freedoms in their own countries. Chinese people are free to come to the U.S. in a variety of capacities, and we give them the benefit of the doubt that they're here for legitimate and legal reasons. That's not always the case. In this case, the Justice Department claims an operative of the Chinese Communist Party was working to undermine a Chinese dissident living in New York who was running for congressional office. The operative is accused of seeking out or even making up derogatory information in hopes of making him lose the race. Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division, Matthew Olson, was quoted in an Associated Press story as saying, Authoritarian states around the world feel emboldened to reach beyond their borders to intimidate or exact reprisals against individuals who dare to speak out against oppression and corruption. Chinese operatives of the government are charged with what are described as brazen and wide-ranging schemes that have gone on for long periods of time. 
The cases were filed in federal court in Brooklyn. They allege schemes to dig up dirt on dissidents, then use the information to intimidate them and stifle their right to free speech here in America. The details of one case say a China-based international technology company hired two men in New York to spy on pro-democracy activists, tried to illegally get a copy of a dissident's tax returns, and conspired to destroy artwork created by another dissident. Two of the men have been arrested, while a third and purported ringleader is still on the loose. The charges include conspiring to commit interstate harassment and criminal use of a means of identification. In another plot, a man who started a pro-democracy organization was secretly collecting information about Chinese dissidents, Uyghurs, Tibetans, and people supportive of Taiwanese independence, and then passing the intelligence on to the Chinese Ministry of State Security. He's been arrested and released on $300,000 bond. The man who wanted to derail the congressional candidate hired a private investigator to dig up anything since 1989, which, as you may remember, was the year of the Tiananmen Square uprising. He asked the investigator for the candidate's phone number, address, and vehicle information, and told the investigator that violence would be fine, too adding that he could be beaten until he could no longer run for office. Well, uh, that's one way a foreign government can influence an American election, isn't it? Just beat the candidate you don't like until he can't run. Luckily, the investigator was also an FBI informant. American officials say efforts by the Chinese Communist Party to find, intimidate, and silence pro-democracy people in other countries is becoming increasingly aggressive. This isn't the first time this has happened, either. Two years ago, eight people were charged in a pressure campaign to coerce a Chinese man living in New Jersey to return to China to face charges. He was wanted in Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party hired people to browbeat him into capitulation. I don't know what he was wanted for, but the Chinese government must have thought it was pretty bad, while the New Jersey government didn't. As it turns out, the congressional candidate that the Chinese targeted was, in fact, a student leader during the Tiananmen Square uprising. But he's lived in the United States for the past 30 years. He says he doesn't know why the Chinese Communist Party is interested in him anymore. I have nothing to do with them, he says. I'm a purely American citizen. As I've pointed out on this program before, China has a long history and a long memory, too. The listening tube works in both directions. Call 570-601-1101 to leave a message. All messages are subject to airing and editing. You can call the listening tube 24 hours a day at area code 570-601-1101. So last week, we talked about teachers. And wouldn't you know it, a meme about teachers shows up in social media. It's a challenge to the public and says, I bet nobody remembers their fifth grade teacher. By the time this one got to me, it had 634,000 comments and 9,100 shares. I was happy to see that some of the comments called out the meme for what it is, but I was sad to see somebody I know, a retired teacher, actually answer the question. Maybe she was proud that she could remember all the way back to when she was 10 years old. I can too. I remember all of my elementary school teachers, Kerstetter, Gessner, Sanders, Hines, Belsky, Duncan, Weaver. Not necessarily in that order. But this meme is just fishing for password information or the answers to security questions. Don't answer these memes and don't share them. You're only helping criminals steal information that could lead to even greater loss. Here's one that likely won't lead to any personal harm, 
but it's another example of how memes are designed to make you do what they want you to do by trying to fool you or by simply lying to you. This one uses the disdain many people have for the founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. It says, After hearing Mark Zuckerberg saying that posting the Lord's Prayer goes against their policies, I am asking all Christians to please follow my example and post the Lord's Prayer. I am announcing my faith publicly. Then he follows with a quote from the New Testament, Matthew 10.33, which quotes Jesus as saying, Everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. The writer goes on to say that this is the best challenge he's ever seen on Facebook. So if you love him and you're not ashamed, please join me in this challenge of faith. Then the Lord's Prayer follows, and he created a hashtag, Faith Challenge. Now, I'm not picking on religion here. I'm criticizing a social media meme. The first thing this meme says is, after hearing Mark Zuckerberg saying that posting the Lord's Prayer goes against their policies. Did he actually say that? I'm going to look that up. He's going to look it up. He's really going to do it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. As it turns out, Mark Zuckerberg never said that, and Facebook does not have a policy against posting the Lord's Prayer. Reuters, USA Today, and others have written about this myth, which started in 2020 and has been revived this year. So when the writer of the meme asks you to follow his example, I guess he's asking you to lie. Sinner. Because that's what he did when he said he heard Mark Zuckerberg say that posting the Lord's Prayer is against their policy. Then he tries to make you feel guilty if you don't share the meme by using a Bible verse. Then he says this is the best challenge he's ever seen on Facebook. Of course it is. You made it. But the author knows most readers won't think of that. Then he takes one more swipe at your conscience by suggesting that if you don't share the meme, you're ashamed of your faith. The person who wrote this meme isn't just a liar. They're also evil, hiding behind a prayer. Can I get an amen? Here's one more that tries to get information out of you by making a game out of it. It says, December has Christmas, January has New Year, February has Valentine. Your birth month has blank. Obviously, the creator of this meme wants to know your birth month. Why? Because it's a piece of the puzzle that leads to somebody making their way into your online accounts. By the time I got this one, it had 1.3 million comments and 22,000 shares. Another treasure trove of information for hackers. It seems like an innocent game to play and lets you make a connection to something good about the month you were born. As if being born wasn't good enough. Well, that can't be right. There's a lot of talk these days about the mainstream media, the news it delivers, and whether or not we should trust it. When I was a young man learning about broadcasting, there was a simple definition of the news. Information about current events the public wants or needs to know. Information about current events the public wants or needs to know. It's a simple definition that covers a lot of ground with the wants or needs to know part. Yet, it keeps a narrow scope by restricting itself to information. So perhaps it's most notable for what's not in it, more than for what is. This definition of news does not include anybody's opinion about said current events. News is different today. The 24-hour news networks have a lot of time to fill. Just doling out the facts doesn't fill the bill. Hence, the void is filled with expert opinion and panels of talking heads with opinions and analysis of whatever news 
and I use that term loosely here, topic is chosen as the focus of the day. Now, you might be thinking, but Bob, you're always expressing your opinion on this program, and you'd be right. But I don't claim to be a news organization. I'm just one guy. I try to find something that may be of interest to people and write about it and record what I wrote and make it available to the public for free. I don't have a staff of writers or an editor who tells me what to write about. I'm not representing somebody else or telling you what I was told to tell you. Do I have media bias? Probably. I do think I'm fortunate to have journalism training today because it helps me recognize the bias in today's newscasts. But there is certainly a bias in my reporting to you as I choose which stories I will bring to you. And those decisions are the result of my personal viewpoints. My personal viewpoints are the result of my experiences, and my experiences are what make me who I am. But I don't consider myself as a solidly conservative or solidly liberal. I have both liberal and conservative viewpoints, depending upon the subject matter. I'm not defined by the Democrats or the Republicans, which is why I'm a registered independent. I'll be honest with you about the stories I tell here. The stories I choose to tell and how I tell them will reveal enough about me for you to form your own opinion of me. I'm just glad you're listening. But enough about me. There's a serious problem with the news media today, and it doesn't matter what political bend you are, or even if you vote or not. All, and when I say that, I mean all, Network and cable news is biased and agenda-driven. Internet-based news sites are even worse. There was a time when you could trust the news. All of the news. TV news, newspapers, radio news, newsreels, and movie theaters. Well, maybe not so much movie theater newsreels. Those were before my time, but I believe they were filled with propaganda when it comes to trustworthy sources of local news, small-town newspapers are still the best. The larger the paper gets, the more its editorial slant reveals itself. Most larger newspapers lean liberal, with notable exceptions. Geography plays a major role in a newspaper's political stance, as appealing to the local population is vital for survival. Most radio stations don't have local news gatherers anymore, but rely on other sources of news like broadcasting stories from the local paper or using services like network feeds of national news. Those network feeds are also subject to political bias. The political bias and opinion-based news is the reason our country is so divided. Each side now has a megaphone to scream at people who already agree with the bias. The large media organizations have discovered that they can appeal to a large group of people who want validation of what they already believe. And there are enough of them that they can charge a lot of money for commercials to pitch products to the believers. It's not about informing you. That's just the candy that gets you in the door. Then the opinion people fill you with content that riles you, makes you mad, and evokes an emotional response just before they show you the product that will make your life better. It's not news, it's manipulation. There's some news in there. That's the cover. They claim to be news programs, but the actual news content is small compared to the opinion content, which is often disguised as analysis or discussion. The discussions have already been pre-planned and talking points highlighted before the conversation even begins. Editors and producers lead the way with the stories they dole out to the reporters and with how the stories are ultimately edited to make the right point. Allow me to give you an example of media manipulation from the Washington Post, which, once it's pointed out to you, is easy to spot. It begins with a labored headline. 
More than two dozen Senate Republicans demand Biden do more for Ukraine after voting against $13.6 billion for Ukraine. First of all, that's not a headline. Dewey beats Truman. That's a headline. Man bites dog. That's a headline. Too hot to fish. That's a headline. More than two dozen Senate Republicans demand Biden do more for Ukraine after voting against $13.6 billion for Ukraine is a summary. Then they follow it up with a sub-headline that states, 31 Senate Republicans voted last week against the $1.5 trillion spending bill to fund the government, increase U.S. defense spending, and provide humanitarian and military assistance to Ukraine. In recent days, many of them have clamored for more weapons and aid. When you combine the headline with the subheadline, it's as if you already know the whole story. There's really no need to read any further because you already don't like Republicans and now you have another reason to assume you're correct about your assumptions. You read the extra long headline and you thought that summed it up pretty well. But then the sub-headline got even more specific, defining more than two dozen more accurately as 31 Republicans. The sub-headline also gets more specific about the cost of the bill, which is $1.5 trillion, of which $13.6 billion will go to Ukraine. But that's not why they voted against the bill. Like the headline is designed to make you believe. If you go past the headline and the subheadline and read the actual story, which many people don't, you'll find out a little more about why said Republicans voted against the bill. One said he voted against it because it wasn't really about Ukrainian aid, but a whole bunch of schlock. Ukrainian aid was a little bit of sugar on the larger medicine of a $1.5 trillion bill that nobody would actually want to go home and to defend to the voters and to the taxpayers of America as well thought out. Something else you might not get out of the headline and the subheadline is that the bill was signed into law a week earlier by President Biden, regardless of who voted for or against it. This story was written for the sole purpose of advancing an agenda. It doesn't fall into the definition of news, but was written entirely for the sole purpose of criticizing senators for representing their constituents. There may have been a number of different reasons why these senators voted the way they did, and they voiced their support for aiding Ukraine, but voted against a bill they thought was full of pork. The Washington Post headline and subheadlines were meant to keep you from reading the whole story, and the story itself was written in a way as to confirm your disdain for the subjects. It's not an accident. As an observer of news coverage and a self-professed news junkie, I couldn't help but notice how much news reporting changed when Donald Trump became President of the United States. Just like everyone else, I didn't know what to expect when a political newcomer suddenly held the most important office in the land. But to me, Donald Trump becoming president wasn't the most surprising thing that happened. What caught my attention was how quickly news reporting changed. I've always been sensitive to news bias because I was taught that it was wrong. I was taught that newscasters and reporters are supposed to be unbiased, just state the facts. Give people the information they need to understand the event. As a news junkie, I was fascinated by upstart CNN back in the 1980s and was thrilled to have a source like that. I was always a fan of CNN and its sister station, Headline News. In 2001, I was introduced to Fox News Channel by the guy who came to hook up my cable when I moved. I watched it for a while until I realized that Steve Ducey was just a mouthpiece for the Republican Party. There might have been more, but I only needed to see one for me to abandon that ship. I tried some of the other all-news channels here and there, but I was always able to rely on CNN. That is, 
until Donald Trump became president. Suddenly, the CNN I knew was gone, replaced by a steady stream of criticism and negativity. It was like a switch had been flipped, and all of the nice news anchors I'd been watching turned into vitriol spewing megaphones intent on reducing our president to a shriveled-up pile of hair. It was sad for me to watch what was once a great news organization devolve into hit-piece conspiracy theorists. Jim Acosta became a joke getting kicked out of the White House press corps only to have CNN sue to get him back in. By then, he'd rendered himself useless as a reporter in that capacity, but CNN kept him there anyway. Let me tell you a story about a woman who wasn't interested in politics at all. At one time, if you Googled her, it said she was apolitical. She didn't care about politics and didn't think politics affected her enough to get interested. Then, Donald Trump became president. An associate of hers always had the news on, mostly on CNN. She began to listen in and then began to pay attention. Eventually, she became so enraged by what she was seeing and hearing on CNN every day that she finally decided to get involved in politics. She started reading political stories and listening to our elected representatives when they made comments. Ultimately, she decided that it was time she made her voice heard. She went to the county administration office and registered to vote as a Republican. Watching CNN's continual bashing of the president created a Republican. Probably not what they were trying to accomplish. Sometimes media manipulation can backfire. Let's go back through the listening tube. It was just about a year and a half ago that the New York Post ran a story about a laptop computer that was taken to a Delaware computer repair shop and never picked up again after being serviced. The person who dropped off the computer was none other than Hunter Biden, the son of the President of the United States. It was one of three laptops brought in by Hunter. The other two were resolved and picked up. The third was in more critical condition. While the owner of the repair shop was transferring files from the laptop to an external hard drive for preservation, he noticed a few things that bothered him, but kept it to himself. After the laptop was never picked up, following the shop's guidelines, it was considered abandoned but the owner of the repair shop was still bothered by what he saw during the transfer and wondered what he should do. He consulted with his dad, a retired Air Force colonel. The dad attempted to turn the hard drive over to the FBI in the summer of 2019, but the FBI turned him down, according to a timeline of events by the World Tribune. The FBI eventually took possession of the original laptop in Delaware in December of 2019. That means the laptop in question was in the hands of the FBI for a year before the public was made aware of it just prior to the November 2020 election. In the meantime, the man who owned the computer repair shop is left wondering why the information he saw about the president's son has not been made public. He contacts several congressmen who don't give him the time of day, then gets in touch with Rudy Giuliani. We're still not sure how, but the New York Post gets a hold of the contents of the laptop and publishes what they say are emails that show Joe Biden was aware of and possibly making money from the activities of Hunter Biden, who is using his father's influence to cut deals with companies in Ukraine and China. If this information had come out prior to the election in 2020, some statistics indicate that Joe Biden would have lost up to 8% of the votes he got, which would have given the election win to the incumbent Donald Trump. But this isn't about Joe or Hunter Biden or Donald Trump. This is about the legacy and social media. 
When the New York Post broke the story about the laptop and the information contained thereon, other news organizations shut the story down. The legacy media practically declared the computer repair shop owner to be a Russian operative working to discredit candidate Biden. Fifty former intelligence officials, some of whom now work for those same media outlets, signed a letter stating that the contents of the laptop, quote, had all the hallmarks of a Russian operation, unquote, even though none of the signers had access to the information itself. The media touted this letter as proof that the contents of the laptop were planted. Social media sites like Facebook and Twitter treated the New York Post story as if it were a conspiracy theory, all in an attempt to keep the story from ruining the chances of their chosen candidate, Joe Biden. Now, just this week, the New York Times admitted, perhaps accidentally, that the New York Post story was true. It wasn't a headline, of course. The telltale sentence was buried deep in a story about the current investigation into Hunter Biden's possible criminal violations concerning taxes, foreign lobbying, and money laundering. Even now that the cat's out of the bag, as far as the laptop is concerned, and that the New York Times has admitted reviewing the emails of part of the research for the story, the legacy media is still ignoring the elephant in the room. Since the New York Times spilled the beans about the laptop and its contents, ABC, NBC, CBS kept silent on the subject in their newscasts on Thursday and Friday. Not a word. Not a word. I'm sure they were caught off guard and needed more time to craft a way to save face. But I'm afraid it's too late. We always knew the legacy media hated Donald Trump. But now we also know that they deceived the American public to intentionally put their candidate of choice in the Oval Office. They killed the story about the Hunter Biden laptop and all of its contents. They discredited anyone who believed the New York Post story and prevented, as much as they could, the dissemination of the truth about Hunter Biden, his shady business deals, and how his father, President Joe Biden, knew about and may have even benefited from the way Hunter Biden peddled his father's influence. The people who run these news divisions for the networks and the people who control the content on social media conspired to overthrow the sitting president of the United States by manipulating what the American public could learn about the opposing candidate. In the days leading up to the 2020 election, the talking heads on CNN, MSNBC, CBS, and NBC all downplayed the Hunter Biden scandal, while ABC News completely ignored the story. The New York Post and the Washington Times were the only major newspapers interested in telling the truth. The New York Times took every opportunity it could to discredit the laptop story right up, to the 2020 election, referring to the purported laptop and falling back on the bogus letter signed by Democratic officials that called it Russian disinformation. The New York Post says, Readers of the Times have discovered in March 2022 that Hunter Biden pursued business deals in Europe and Asia and may have leveraged his father's position as vice president to do it. Hunter also may not have properly registered with the government or declared all his income. All legitimate topics of discussion about a presidential candidate's family, no. Readers of the Post have known this since October 2020. And just to make sure the New York Times got the message, the New York Post editorial board wrote, Forgive the profanity, but you have got to be shitting us. Now, with the president's poll numbers falling well below anything desirable, the press is reluctantly admitting that maybe what they've done was a mistake. 
Inflation is out of control. Gasoline prices are at historic highs. Major cities are mired in rising crime rates, while liberal prosecutors are undoing the work of the police. The media has tried to protect the president they chose to put in office, but they're finding it more and more difficult. And that's just domestic policy. Foreign policy hasn't fared much better. From the tragic exit from Afghanistan to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the folly of sending the vice president to Central America to try to discover the causal effect of the overwhelming illegal immigration across our southern border. You can blame Joe Biden or not. It really doesn't matter. The legacy media chose him over Donald Trump because they didn't like Donald Trump. And it really didn't matter who the media appointed president, they would just be a mouthpiece for the agenda others put into place. He's kind of like Zaphod Beeblebrox, president of the galaxy in the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Zaphod's job as president was to distract you from where the power actually lies. It's starting to look like that's Joe's job, too. Even if Joe Biden is pulling most of the strings, no president pulls all of them, regardless if you're glad he's president or not, it looks like the people didn't put him in that position. The press did. A free press is vital to our constitutional republic. It's the fourth estate, the watchdogs of our government. Or at least it's supposed to be. A CNBC reporter recently said on live television that it's their job to control how people think. That's a far cry from the definition of news that I was taught. The definition that I still believe in. News is information about current events the public wants or needs to know. Most of the legacy media no longer subscribes to that definition. They will tell you the stories they want you to hear in a way that supports their views and desires and outcomes. They won't tell you the stories that don't. So, what's the answer, Bob? Well, all I can tell you is be critical of what you hear and see on the news. Think about the way a story is told. Did it actually have useful content, or was it just being suggestive? Was it something you wanted to know? Was it something you needed to know? Can it be verified by another source? The people in Russia right now are being lied to by their news media. The Kremlin controls nearly everything they tell people. Many of them know they're being lied to, and many don't. So, a state-run media isn't the answer. But a free press has taken advantage of its power to control the people, just like a communist government might. When we can't trust the New York Times, the old gray lady, the paper of record, then we're in a position we've never been before. The Listening Tube is written and produced by yours truly, copyright 2022. Thank you for being a part of the Listening Tube. I'm your host, Bob Woodley, for Thou Ad Infinitum.